Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Dan Painter, Product Training and Development Manager here at Flint & Walling and your host for today's web conference uh, titled Multimeter Testing of Submersible Motors. Uh, this is looks like uh, we're about round, rounding out our winter web conferences. Uh, this is the next to the last one. Um, and then I will be putting up a whole new schedule for the uh, spring summer. So check the website out, which is where you probably had to go to register for this event to begin with. Um, but again, today's uh, topic is testing four inch subs with the uh, use of a multimeter and understanding uh, the resistance values and so on and so forth. Uh, so with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, before we actually get into the testing, and by the way, uh, rarely do these web conferences uh, usually take any more than 35 to 40 minutes, even though we allot an hour. Uh, but uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm actually going to walk you through uh, the inside of a four inch submersible motor just so you're uh, more familiar with the various components inside these motors and uh, particularly their functionality. So when we go ahead and, and, and like I said, I'm just going to identify a few of the components moving top to bottom and then we'll get right into the multimeter testing. Uh, looking at the top of a submersible pump motor, uh, most everybody is well aware of the shaft and spline uh, assembly that engages with the uh, pump end coupling. Uh, and then the, uh, the uh, sand slinger, which is also pretty common. Uh, these uh, are very visible on submersible motors, and I'm pretty sure everybody that manufactures a submersible motor would use a sand slinger. Just below that sand slinger is a lip seal. Now I'm going to circle back on that uh, here in a little bit, uh, but that lip seal is is very important. Think of it as a cartridge or a mechanical seal that would be used in an above ground pump where the uh, pump motor shaft enters the pump end, uh, we want to make sure we've got a seal there uh, that separates the two. And like I said, I'm going to circle back on this lip seal here in a, a little while. Um, uh, when we look at the end bells, um, uh, we use uh, stainless steel uh, stator end bells. Uh, we actually uh, have a test that we perform here at Flint and Walling. We call it Instant Ocean. But uh, when we were in the design and development of this motor, uh, we were looking at corrosivity. And so if you're not using stainless steel end bells, rather with a material more resembling cast iron, sometimes that'll show its face in aggressive uh, water supplies. And I'm pretty sure most pump installers have pulled pumps in the past where they'll see you know, orange streaks running down the motor. Um, that's either coming from the water quality itself, uh, which there are iron bearing water supplies out there, or it could be due to certain uh, cast iron components uh, that are built into the motor. But like I mentioned, uh, we're using, I'm going to try to grab my laser pointer here. We're using both up here at the top and down at the bottom uh, stainless steel uh, stator end bells. Just below the top end bell, uh, a lot of components that go on the inside of a submersible pump motor in many ways. Uh, it's uh, kind of like building a ship in a bottle. But um, here on this motor, per, you can see that uh, we have uh, lightning arresters uh, located here. Uh, they'll be inserted again into the tops uh, of the, actually the bottom side of the top end bell. And uh, we've got lightning arresters up there. Uh, the lead socket is located right here, and that's where your motor lead will uh, plug into. And uh, we want to make sure that we don't have any leak paths uh, in that area, so we'll put a sealant. Barely see it on your screen, but there's a sealant that we'll put around not only that uh, lead socket, uh, but uh, the thermal overload's buried down in there, and then of course the two-wire switch over here. Um, you don't want a leak path to the two-wire switch, and so uh, there'll be a sealant that will go around that as well. When you look at these two-wire switches, uh, there is a set of contacts on the inside that make and break 
Uh, that, that switch is used on two wire motors. It's not on a three wire motor, but that switch is used on all two wire motors. And that breaking and making of those contacts that you see right down in here is what allows that motor to go from the start windings into the run windings. So all these components are, are built in. Uh, the top of that end, uh, end belt, what will happen uh, in the next stage is this end belt will get flipped completely upside down. So all these components will be down into the motor shell itself. So that will get flipped upside down. And then typically uh, we'll put a laser weld around that. Uh, that holds everything in place. Uh, inside of the motor itself is, is what's called a rotor liner. Uh, this is a thin piece of stainless steel. It's tubular in shape, and it is welded both at the top and at the bottom uh, so that everything outside that liner, which is your stator, your, your uh, stator windings, uh, that's all on the isolated from the inside uh, where that uh, rotor liner sits. The rotor itself uh, is a die cast uh, rotor. We die cast those rotors here. If you ever have an opportunity to make a trip back to our factory, we give a tour about every week over the winter time. And uh, in fact, I've got one yet this week, and I will be showing our attendees uh, how these rotors get uh, die cast. But uh, uh, this image here is, is a single lamb. It's called a rotor lamb. And as you build this rotor up, basically what you're going to do is you're going to stack these lambs up on top of each other. And when you die cast it, that's what that rotor will look like. So all these little channels that you see around that rotor lamb will have, uh, we pour molten aluminum down in there and fill up those channels with an electrical grade aluminum. But this is what's called a die cast rotor. This rotor will sit inside of this rotor liner over here. So uh, this is the area where the rotor's located. It's the uh, moving part of that motor. There you go. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about when it comes to these motors and how they're constructed is what we call uh, encapsulation. And this encapsulation is this black material that you see. Um, when we encapsulate a motor, it, literally everything outside of that rotor liner, which is again welded in place, everything on, out, on the outside of that liner is going to be encapsulated, including the uh, stator windings down here. And uh, a couple things we want to be sure of when we encapsulate motors. I was at a trade show one day, and, and cell phones have made pretty good photographers of all of us, and I come across the motor, and uh, what I saw was probably not something most contractors would have seen walking past. I'm not even sure the people that uh, were in the booth that this motor was located in saw it either, but uh, I'll tell you what I saw. I saw lots and lots of air pockets, and uh, we, we kind of frown on that notion of having air pockets in that encapsulation, because if we look at encapsulation and try to boil it down to, you know, what is the primary objective of that encapsulation? Well, you all know these are water-cooled motors, and so that encapsulation helps carry heat away from those windings. And so you don't want a bunch of air pockets in there. Our team here believes that as that motor comes up to temperature, that the air pockets will, will much more rapidly heat up and, of course, have a risk of expanding. Uh, so we, we don't want a, an encapsulation that looks like a Milky Way bar. We want it to be solid, both at the top and at the bottom. So we want solid encapsulation all the way through, uh, top and bottom, again, to help dissipate the heat away from those windings. A uh, couple of last things I'll talk about here regarding a motor is the fill solution. And the fill solution, uh, most of you have probably heard of that. Most all these motors are going to come with fill solution. And that fill solution will fill up that liner on the inside where the rotor is located. Uh, one thing that we did find uh, is that, A, uh, fill solution is not just one material. Rather, it's more like a recipe. And when we were in field tests several years ago, uh, we were tweaking this fill solution up and down, and as we tweaked it one way or another, uh, we found that it had a direct correlation to that lip seal at the top. So 
uh, as we began to perfect that recipe, uh, what we found, at least in our studies, is that even after a 24-month audit, a, a pump and motor being in a well for two years, uh, we'd bring it back and we would inspect wear patterns. And what we were finding is that we were not seeing any wear patterns whatsoever on that lip seal. So I think we do a pretty good job with that fill solution. And then one thing that uh, I think we do a really good job with, and that's something most of you would be familiar with, is the, uh, some people call this a Kingsbury type bearing or an axial bearing or a thrust bearing. But it sits down in the very bottom of the motor and it consists of these segments or, or shoes, as some people would call them. And then there's a carbon bearing that you can see pictured on your screen. That carbon bearing comes down and it will sit on top of those shoes. Uh, I think we've done a really good job with this portion of the motor, particularly. Uh, in fact, uh, we put a 700 pound thrust bearing in every motor we manufacture from half uh, up to two horsepower. So even our fractional horsepower motors We'll have the uh, the 750 pound thrust bearing. We spent a lot of time uh, looking at this portion of the motor because uh, historically, and I think anybody that's been around the well drilling trade or pump installation trade for very long, probably has had a, a bottom thrust bearing uh, go out on them. This is next image is not one of our uh, thrust bearings, but it's it's what happens to them. Um, when they uh, when you lose a, a bottom thrust bearing so you can see the carbon there is cracked and uh, one telltale sign that you've lost a bottom thrust bearing in a motor is that the shaft will drop so as that bottom thrust bearing goes away it allows that rotor to drop and that rotor's got a shaft that's hooked to it so it also drops and it becomes disengaged or at least partially disengaged from the pump end coupling and that's when you can really start to tear things up you don't have a full engagement of that spline on the top of that motor with the pump coupling, uh, you run the risk of, of uh, just, just tearing it up. Uh, so most of you are well aware that shaft height gauges are, are available so that when you set a shaft height gauge down on a four inch submersible motor, uh, you just set it right over the top of the shaft and that thing ought to swing back and forth kind of like a porch swing. However, when you lose that bottom bearing, uh, that that won't swing anymore, and that's a, like I said, that's a telltale indication that the, uh, the thrust bearing at the bottom of that motor is, um, has let go and it's allowed that shaft to drop. Again, these shaft height gauges are a dime a dozen. If you don't have any, let us know, and we'll get get some to you. Um, like I said, they, uh, these uh, most most every motor manufacturer would have a shaft height gauge. Of their own, but uh, just to circle back on this uh, thrust bearing again, I want to some in a classroom setting, and this will probably occur later this week. I typically ask guys there outside, so you know, how many of you have ever been to Gatlinburg, Tennessee? You know, it's a touristy town on the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, uh, up and down Main Street, or or any number of places to allow you to spend your money, uh, touristy stuff, souvenirs, taffy, all that. They happen to have a, 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 a business down there called the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, and I think most of you might have heard that before. But there's an attraction right outside the front of that museum, and it happens to be this solid granite ball. And they, they put this right in the sidewalk, and the whole notion behind this solid granite ball is these people, like you see here, can come up, and they can, they can rotate that ball in any direction they so desire. Now that ball uh, weighs a little over 10,000 pounds. So you, you take a little girl like back here, maybe 50, 60 pound girl, you would wonder how can a young child have any influence over this ball whatsoever? Well, if you look at the bottom of the photograph down here at the bottom, and I hope you're seeing this little highlighter I've got, uh, that ball is actually floating on water. And that's why this uh, can be manipulated in any direction because it's 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 floating on water. And so when we take our thrust bearing and we put it together, uh, we bring those segments down. And like I said, we use three shoes on our thrust bearing. So there's three segments that come down. And then the, the carbon bearing will, will sit down on top of those segments. 
The only time we want that carbon bearing to actually be in contact with those segments is when the motor is in standby or idle position. Uh, reason that ball uh, is, is you're able to move it is because it floats on a very, very thin film of water. You can think of it in this term too. If you have a six, seven, eight thousand pound vehicle and you're running down a highway where you've got torrential rains going on, uh, there's this phenomenon called hydroplaning, which is when you get a thin film of water between those rubber tires and that pavement. And when that happens, uh, you no longer have control of that vehicle. In fact, it's no different than being on ice. It just, it's gonna go wherever it wants to go. Uh, because it's floating on that thin film of water. And that's exactly uh, what we've accomplished with this bottom thrust bearing here. So that uh, when the motor's running, this, this bearing is not in contact with those segments of those shoes at all. We've done some modifications to the segments and the shoes uh, to be able to get a nice thin uh, film of water to glide through there very, very efficiently. And once again, on a 24 month audit, bringing these pump the motors back, uh, we found that uh, we were not getting any wear at all on that bottom bearing. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to walk you through a few uh, of the components that make up, um, make up these motors. And so we ultimately want to float that bearing. But guys, I mean, these are not uh, typically, uh, motors not something that you readily get to see all the time unless you attend a trade show where somebody may have a cutaway there because they're not repairable. You can't take them apart. And I think as professionals in your given market, having some of this information in your back pocket uh, can be beneficial with, uh, over time. So now we're gonna go into that multimeter test. <clears throat> so when we look at multimeters, I'm gonna get that cursor off the screen there. Uh, a couple of them that are available, readily available. One on the left-hand side is a digital. The one on the right hand side, that Simpson 372, that's what I actually cut my teeth on. It's an analog meter uh, and still being used to this very day. Uh, but one thing you needed to know about the analog meters is that uh, it had an adjustable scale that you had to set prior to taking the measurement. So there's a dial down at the bottom that allows you to uh, dial that scale in so you can get more accurate readings. And then in addition to having to adjust that scale, uh, you would have to zero that meter in as well. And there was a dial above uh, that would allow you to, to zero your meter in uh, so that uh, you could get good numbers from it when you actually use it. On the contrary, the digital meters, uh, they have auto ranging features and there's no need to adjust the scale prior to measurement and you don't have to zero it out. So. Uh, just the, the, I'm going to guess that today digital meters are probably, they haven't taken over the analog. They rapidly are because our whole um, society now is, is, is pretty much electronic and digital. So a lot of contractors are using digital meters today. Irrespective of whether you're using a digital or an analog uh, multimeter, uh, just a couple of housekeeping things that you want to make sure before you start taking uh, readings off the motor is you want to make sure that you've got functionality out of your multimeter. And so taking the two probes and making contact between the two probes ought to give you what's known as an infinity reading. And that infinity reading can be displayed one of two ways, either an OL, like you see on the left there, or simply a one. Uh, but you want to make sure you got a functional meter, batteries up, and all those good things. And that's just a quick, quick way of uh, knowing that your, your meter is going to give you some uh, good, good re readings. Another part of the housekeeping is obviously you want to make sure that there's no power to the motor as you're conducting these tests. Uh, Multimeters uh, measures resistance in ohms, and they do that without any power uh, applied whatsoever. So moving on to the motors themselves, we've got a couple of different types of motors. A uh, two-wire motor, very popular here in the east. Um, at least my experience has been as you cross the Mississippi River and head west in this country, um, there's fewer two-wire motors sold and more three-wire motors sold. Uh, I'm not sure where everybody at sitting on this uh, web conference is, you know, where you're at geographically, but 
when we look at a two-wire motor, there's actually uh, three leads that come off that motor. Uh, we'll call them lead A and lead B. They're both black. And then, of course, you've got a ground wire. On a three-wire motor, uh, you've got a red, black, and yellow uh, lead along with that ground wire. And I want, I want to identify these uh, leads on a three-wire motor. Um, so there you go. The uh, yellow is your common. Uh, that's your common. And then the uh, black is your, is your run, uh, run windings, and the red is the start windings. Of course, as I mentioned, the green is a ground. So just identifying these leads and, and, and uh, you know, knowing what each one of these leads, the function and purpose it serves, uh, you can now use your multimeter. And with your multimeter, you, there are several things we can determine. One, we can determine if the motor is good. Uh, we can determine whether the motor is grounded or not. We can also uh, uh, detect whether it's shorted or has open windings and uh, of course mixed leads. So those are five things right there that uh, we can kind of get a grade card on the health of a motor uh, with the use of a multimeter. So let's go through and, and um, explain how we can uh, determine each one of these conditions that may or may not exist. So, so let's go with the ground. Um, we'll determine the ground first. So uh, to, to determine uh, if a motor is grounded or not, uh, what we're going to do in this case is we're going to measure each lead to ground. So with the case of a two-wire motor, uh, we'll measure, uh, like I said, each lead to ground. And with the three-wire motor, it's the same thing. So when you're testing uh, to determine whether a motor is grounded or not, you will take each lead to ground. And this is the only test that we'll conduct on this motor where we're going to actually bring up, up the ground into it. But if you have no resistance at all, if you've got no resistance and you're showing infinity on your meter, uh, then you can at least have the uh, satisfaction of knowing that that motor is not grounded. I'm not saying it's good, I'm just saying it's not grounded. Uh, and again, you'll make that determination by showing no resistance whatsoever. On the other hand, if you do get some resistance, Sometimes this doesn't, this doesn't have to be very much. I'm, I'm just the, the, the presence of resistance uh, is going to indicate that the motor is grounded. Uh, so there's a very easy test to do on a, a submersible pump motor uh, to determine whether it's grounded or not. So um, if showing resistance on any lead, it'll indicate a ground. And in most cases, uh, you'll probably get resistance on essentially every one of those leads. I've talked to a number of contractors. They all nod their head up and down. Yes, um, when you have a, a grounded motor, you can virtually take the red, the yellow, the black. Um, you'll have resistance going to ground across each one of those leads. If you test an old motor, and back in the old days, uh, they didn't have uh, ground wires on them. Uh, so if you test an old motor, you've got a couple of choices. Uh, again, uh, to determine a ground, you need to go from a lead to a ground. So uh, you can either use the uh, side shell of a steel casing, or sometimes if, the, if you pulled the pump and you got the pump and motor above ground, you can use the side shell of the, the motor also to get a good ground so that you can uh, determine whether there's any resistance across those leads. So in our little chart here, when we look at uh, trying to uh, determine if a motor is grounded or not. I'm going to measure each lead to ground. If there's no resistance, then the motor is not grounded. And if there is resistance, albeit very small, uh, that'll indicate a motor that has um, that is grounded. The uh, and again, the the test for grounding is the only time we're going to use the uh, ground, uh, the green wire, uh, in our multimeter testing. So the the next three. Um, shorts, uh, open windings, or mixed leads. When we make those determinations, we're going to measure each lead to lead. So uh, looking at a three-wire motor, uh, we're going to measure the, uh, uh, the uh, common and run windings, uh, which should have your lowest value of resistance right there. Um, we'll measure the yellow to red which is going to be the intermediate value. And you'll see all this come into play here in another slide or two. And then your run and start windings together are going to give you the highest value. 
um, when we talk about these values and you know what should they be other than saying okay your yellow and black should be the lowest and your red and black should be the highest um, what are those values what what are those values supposed to be well I know Franklin historically has put out a great publication called a name manual Flint Walling has one that we call our motor application guide but within in it, Within these manuals, um, you'll come across a, a section in there that's going to have uh, all this data on it. So, for instance, if we look at this uh, this chart here, uh, over on the left-hand side, there's your motors by horsepower, separated two wire from three wire. Uh, so there's there's where the motors are identified, and then. Uh, you come over here to the winding resistance, and that's going to show you what those values should be uh, on a good motor. Uh, why we put those so far apart, John me, I'm bringing them together. So just for the sake of this discussion, let's just suppose we were going to test a three-wire motor, a horse and a half, horse and a half three-wire motor. So uh, looking at our chart here, uh, we've got two sets of values. We've got an M value that shows resistance between 1.7 and 2.2 ohms. And we've got an A value that's uh, 7.8 to 9.6. And we ask, you know, what in the world is the A and the M all about? Well, there it is. Uh, the M is uh, going to be your um, yellow to black. Again, so the, the values there should be coming in at 1.7 to 2.2. And then the A is going to be the yellow to red, uh, showing a resistance values of between 7.8 and 9.6. So when we're testing a motor then, um, and we looked up these values, so there's the values uh, on a half or horse and a half three wire motor. Uh, so if we were using our, our, our multimeter, and again, we're going lead to lead. So if we go, um, if we go ye yellow to black and we get a reading of two ohms, well, that falls well within the range of acceptability. And so I'd give that one a, an A, it passed. Um, we do the yellow to red and we end up with eight ohms. Uh, once again, that's falling within the, the resistance range of 7.8 to 9.6. So that, that's good. And then we do the yellow, or I'm sorry, the black and red, which are your run and start windings. We do those together, and that comes in at 10 ohms. So here you would have your lowest resistance, your intermediate resistance, and your highest resistance. And I'm going to go ahead and give that 10 ohms a green green check. So this would be a motor that checks out fine uh, from a from a short or open winding or mixed leads. Um, all these are falling within the uh, uh, the specified values. Some people have asked me why I went on ahead and gave a, the 10 a check mark because uh, those values aren't uh, indicated in the uh, motor application guide. And uh, one way of doing that and one way of you knowing, maybe even with or without a, a uh, motor guide, is, is, um, is this. Uh, your intermediate and your low value ought to be what your high value indicates. So it's just a simple math uh, uh, addition there so that you take your lowest value, add it to your intermediate value, and that ought to be uh, at least give you a ballpark as to where your highest value should be. Uh, so if you don't know, you know, if you, if you didn't even know the values at all, let's, let's go back here. We don't even know the values. Um, Knowing that your lowest and your intermediate ought to equal your your highest, uh, if I take a, a, a an ohm reading on my yellow and black and I come up with 3.2, I don't know if that's good or bad um, at this point because I don't know what the specified values are. But I'll record that 3.2, and then when I do an intermediate value, I'm showing 12.8. So um, you know, so far everything's good. I mean, the intermediate value is a higher uh, value than the lowest. And so based on what we talked about in the previous slide, uh, looks to me like we should be showing uh, for our high value, we ought to be showing somewhere around 16. Again, if you add the 
lowest value to the intermediate value you should come up with you know somewhere around 16 and if i end up uh, testing that red and black wire and i'm showing a 15.8 that gives me at least some peace of mind not even knowing what the values are but knowing that the lowest and the intermediate should equal or very close equal the highest that kind of gives me an idea that uh, uh that motor uh is, is testing out okay for shorts and, and uh, open windings. If I go back and look at the manual and want to know, you know, based on the readings I'm getting, you know, what what size motor should this be? Well, this particular motor, if we look at the manual, is going to be uh, dictating a three-quarter horse three-wire motor because in the manual. Uh, these are the values that are given for that three-quarter horse three wire. So you can see, based on our readings, that we're falling within those range, within those ranges, within those values. And uh, so that's how we're, we're doing that there. Uh, going back to that horse and a half three wire that we started the, this topic on, and there's the values up there. If I, um, if I run a test, and I, again, doing the yellow and the black, uh, I come up with 1.8. That's that's good. That's falling within that range. And then I do my yellow and red, and I come up with a value that's actually lower than specified. <clears throat> we can see that. Um, and at this point, you can get rid of the math that we used to do by adding the lowest and the highest, because who knows um, where that value is going to come in. And so we show 0 0.2 there. And here's what I want to you know try to help especially for the younger generation that uh, may be new to this. Um, if you have a value that's lower than specified, lower, that's going to be the indicate of a, that's going to be an indication of a short. And so again, um, think of it this way, you know, if, if you're lower then you're shorter and I try to do it with word association to put it in my thick skull. Uh, but if I am getting values that are coming up lower than my specified values, then I'm indicating that there's a, a short. And when we look at those two values that are low, uh, the bottom two, and we look at what we tested to uh, determine that, well, we, we checked the yellow to red and we checked the black to red. So there is a commonality within that, and that happens to be the red, the red wire. So more than likely, the short's gonna be in that, in that red wire there uh, because that appears and both of these two um, readings, that's the common wire between those two. So that would be a short. So uh, measure each lead to lead. It's within specified range. It's a good motor. But the values are lower, lower uh, than the specified range. That would indicate a short. So um, think of it in those terms, lower, the sh shorter. So. Next, we'll go to the open leads or the open windings and the mixed leads. Again, showing those values up here. Uh, if I run a yellow and black test and I'm showing eight ohms as resistance, that's higher. That's higher than the uh, specified value. So that one fails there. Um, so when the values are higher, we you know my next one might come in at 9.4. Um, there you go. So. Uh, looking at this area up here, where we do show specified values in, the, in um, the application guide, the motor application guide, unpassed, uncome in higher. So when you look at a value that's higher than the specified value, uh, that's going to be the indicate of an open winding. Think of it as open skies. It goes high as you want. So higher the uh, values, uh, higher when the values are higher than the specified values, uh, it's going to indicate an open winding. And, and once again, if we, we look at our test here, um, you know, we, we, we failed up here and we failed down here because, as, as I mentioned, this is the lowest the intermediate. Add those together, you should come up with a, <clears throat> the highest value. So, so these two have failed. And looking back over here where we uh, got the yellow and the black and we got the black and the red, uh, the one common uh, winding in that is is the black. Uh, so more than likely, you've got an open run winding in that motor. 
And that black is the is a is a culprit with every, with both of these that uh, came in as as failed results over here. For measuring uh, uh, each lead to lead again, uh, specified range is always going to be a good motor. However, if you have a higher than specified range, uh, that's going to be your indication of an open winding. And then the last of the uh, tests that we'll perform on this motor is uh, is uh, we come in here at eight, well, that's higher. We come in here um, at 5.3, well, that's lower. Um, when you have uh, values that are, some are higher and some are lower, um, that's going to be the indication of a uh, mixed, uh, mixed leads. And not, this is not going to happen very often. Uh, certainly, it couldn't even get out of the building here because it wouldn't pass our test. And we do 100% testing on every one of these motors. So I suppose, I suppose if the lead socket weren't put in properly uh, when the motor was manufactured, you plug a, a, a pigtail into it, well, you know, you're not hooking the, uh, the wires up to the proper terminals, so you could have higher or lower results uh, based on your readings. Like I said, that probably, well, that would never happen here and probably doesn't happen often. I would have to imagine oftentimes where you would maybe end up with a reading like this. I'd probably go to the splice. Uh, there's a chance that when the motor was spliced back together, uh, one of the leads got mixed up. So again, that's a that's a indication of mixed leads. So again, uh, the only time we measure leads to ground is foreground. Everything else that we're going to talk about is going to be measured lead to lead. So you have some higher and some lower. Uh, that's going to be the indication of mixed leads. So with the multimeter, uh, there's much that we can tell. Uh, when we understand the values, and when we understand the, the low, intermediate, and highest values, and, and those correlations there, and your run and start windings should always show, your red and black should always show the highest of the, uh, of the values. So, oh, we're about 40 minutes uh, in, and, and 35, 40 minutes in, and, and I'm at the end of this presentation, uh, short, sweet. Um, Something more ideal than, than this on a web conference is I know a lot of times when we do our training, uh, we everybody's got multimeters, everybody's got motors, and so uh, they can go, we instruct the contractor to go around and do the readings on, on a variety of motors and then determine based on those readings whether they have a grounded motor, shorted motor, motor with open windings, or perhaps that rare occasion where you would have mixed leads. Uh, but again, much can be determined with the use of a multimeter. So with that, uh, uh, down to one last web conference here uh, of a couple weeks, I believe. Uh, and uh, we're switching gears up for that one. We're going to talk about VFDs and, and the, uh, particularly the quick start programs that are built into these these days. And just go through those uh, programming uh, so that uh, when you install a variable frequency drive on a pump and motor assembly, you can leave without having to cross your fingers. Well, I welcome you back for that uh, web conference. And again, please check the, uh, the website as I will be posting a new schedule up probably in April uh, that'll take us through our spring and summer months. But with that said, uh, this web conference is now ended. If you're traveling, please travel safe. Please keep the hands washed. And until next time, be safe. Thank you. This web conference has now ended.